thing that's possible. Um, okay. So I'm going to be talking about uh, hardening the stratum, the Bitcoin mining protocol, and I would like to start this discussion with, is this, is this good? Is everybody hearing me? Um, I would like to start this discussion by uh, very briefly describing the Bitcoin mining process. Now, this is the process uh, that the Bitcoin network uses to create new coins. And essentially, participating nodes, which we call miners, are supposed to solve, uh, compete to solve this very simple mathematical puzzle for which they get rewarded, these newly created coins. Now, um, first of all, they need to create what we call a template, a block template, which is depicted here in the figure with the letter F. And what goes into this template is, are these parameters that actually reflect the current state of the Bitcoin network. You can see uh, we have some transactions depicted there. We also have a, a previous pointer to, to the previous block into the blockchain. And we also have the Coinbase transaction, which is a special transaction that records the newly created coins. Um, uh, we also have a little more details on, on the creation of this uh, template, but they're not very important for our discussion. What is really important, though, is that they're supposed to also figure out this nonsense. They, they create actually two nonsense. And they're supposed to find these values such that when they apply a double SHA-256 function, we get at least D leading zero bits. Now, as you can imagine, the more leading zero bits that we require, the harder it is to solve this puzzle. And this allows us to introduce the notion of a difficulty of the puzzle. It turns out that this difficulty is adaptive, so that means that the Bitcoin network is constantly updating this difficulty in order to keep the rate of newly created coins uh, constant. Now, as you can imagine, um, the current Bitcoin difficulty, as more miners uh, have been joining this process, uh, the current Bitcoin difficulty has, has increased so high that uh, a smaller or lower uh, ability miners uh, are not able to solve this puzzle by themselves. So what they start to do is they, they start aggregating into these mining pools, essentially engaging into a master slave paradigm. And now these pool servers are actually supposed to create these jobs and assign them to the miners. Of course, these jobs are, are of a smaller difficulty so they can solve them, right? And the solutions to these jobs are actually, call, uh, we call them now shares. It turns out that for the pool server to redistribute the reward, uh, they just need to count the shares that the miners have submitted and also take into account the difficulty uh, that these shares uh, were created. Now, in order to, to exchange all this communication, they needed a new protocol, and that's how the Stratum protocol was born. Um, we are depicting in this figure here uh, the minimal set of packages that any protocol would, would need to, to exchange. Uh, we needed to exchange, uh, for instance, a set share difficulty packet. We also need to be able to assign jobs. And finally, we also need to be able to submit shares. Now, the most important problem with this protocol is that everything is done in clear text. And this is what we're going to be exploiting uh, on the following attacks. Now, this is uh, what a sample timeline of a Stratum protocol looks like. On the uh, x-axis, we have uh, the time where the packet was collected. And on the y-axis, we, we have the message type. Uh, indicated by height and also by color. Um, I would like to draw your attention to uh, a couple of observations here. The mo most of the difficulty packets occur at the beginning of the exchange. You can barely see this on this uh, thick yellow line at the beginning. And also another important observation is that the majority of the share submissions are actually accepted, which are the uh, green bars at the bottom. And only very few of them are rejected or ignored, which are the red bars and the black bars down there. Now, the importance of these observations are going to become apparent once we start talking about the attacks um, that we actually evaluated, which is, which is what we're going to uh, talk about next. Now, we evaluated three types of, attack, of attacks in increasing level of sophistication of our adversary. Now, the first attack is a, a normal eavesdropper attack. And we require that the adversary is able to observe all the information inside each of these packets. Now, the next sophistication in attack is an attacker that does no longer need all this information, but it only requires the metadata of the packets. So we are, maybe this is something like the adversary was able to get a hold of the ISP logs. And finally, the, 
most sophisticated attacker is able to take advantage of injecting, replaying, and modifying packets. So let's take a look at the first attack. The, this is a passive attack, and we call it the stratup attack. Um, this is where the attacker is able to observe all the communication of the stratum exchange. And the goal of this attack is to figure out how much is the victim miner earning from the mining activity. Now, if we live in a country like the US, this is probably not a very big deal, right? But it turns out that if you are in a third, some third world countries, or in a country where your government is not very respectful of your rights, uh, this can actually expose you to quite a lot of danger, maybe uh, extortion or kidnapping or even uh, prosecution, like some notable cases that have been documented, for instance, in Venezuela or Vietnam. Now, in order to carry out this attack, um, the adversary actually is, is very simple to perform. First, he needs to identify an interval of constant difficulty, and he can do that because he can identify these yellow bars, which are the shared difficulty uh, packets. And once it identifies this, this interval, he measures the length of the interval, and he also measures uh, the amount of shares that have been submitted there. With, that, with those informations, he can actually calculate the average time that the miner requires in order to solve this puzzle. And he also needs the difficulty that he also reads off from the set difficulty packages. And now using all this information, he actually gets a hold of the hash rate uh, uh, value, which is a, a concept that we haven't talked about yet. But it essentially uh, is proportional to the amount of computational power that the miner has actually contributed to the pool. And so with this hash rate, he essentially uses a conversion rate between hash rate to Bitcoin, uh, to Bitcoin payout. And he essentially obtains uh, the earnings of the miner. Now, most pools actually publish this hash rate to BTC conversion rate uh, for transparency purposes. Now, this shouldn't be very surprising, right? Because, I mean, the pool is actually obtaining the same, exactly the same information that the attacker is actually using. So if the pool is able to do it, why shouldn't the attacker do it? However, what is a little bit more surprising is that the attacker actually does not need to know all this information. He, uh, this is, and this is the, our second level of attack sophistication. Uh, in, this, in this scenario, the attacker is no longer allowed to take a look at the payload of the packet. And however, he can still recover the payouts of the victim by uh, noticing uh, some crucial observations that we're going to talk about next. So the first observation is that approximately the first 50 packets of the stratum uh, exchange are not a shared difficulty change of packets. And so we again have this, uh, an interval of constant difficulty. The next thing that it, uh, it realizes is that most pools actually set a, a default difficulty. In our case, this was a 1024 value. So the attacker simply uses that value again. And finally, the, the last observation that we talked about before is that most stratum packages are actually shared submissions which are accepted. So he simply counts the first 50 packets he takes the time that these packets uh, require in order to be transmitted, and he uses the, the default difficulty. So again, he uses the same formula, and again, he infers uh, the actual payout of the victim. Now, the importance of this S scenario is not the scenario itself, is that uh, it is actually very similar to a, a scenario where um, your packets are actually protected with something like TLS or something like blanket encryption. Again, in that other scenario, the attacker is not able to take a look at the packet's payload. However, he's able to infer some information from the metadata of the packets. So the success of this attack is actually telling us that encryption is not enough. Now, this is, these are the results of our attacks. We have on the x-axis, uh, we vary the frequency of our uh, mining device. And this is actually simulating several uh, um, mining equipment. Now, on the blue disks, uh, this is the series of the Stratup prediction. And uh, I suspect that this is very similar to the actual payout. Now, what is a little bit surprising is that by uh, uh, using the procedure that we just described, we can actually uh, predict the, uh, the actual payout 
with a pretty good accuracy, as measured by the mean square error and the mean percentage error. Now, the last attack that I would like to talk about is uh, this active attack. And essentially, it just starts with the adversary um, obtaining, <laughs> obtaining a job assignment from the pool server and injecting this assignment into the miner, making it believe that it comes from the pool server. And as soon as the server, uh, as soon as the miner uh, sh submits this share, it, uh, the adversary intercepts this share and submits it to the pool server as if it was from, from the adversary and essentially claiming um, credit for it. Now, I have uh, the design of our uh, proof of concept solution. It uses IP tables in order to capture packets. It also uses a SCAPI uh, for packet uh, manipulation and, and also packet decoding. We also develop a wire ghost middleware that is supposed to maintain the TCP synchronization, active resynchronization of the TCP hijacking uh, activities. And finally, the Bitcoin module that is supposed to keep track of all these job as new job assignments and the share hijacking. Now, how do we solve this? So for us, a good solution is supposed to protect against the stratum attacks that we just described, but it, it should also be resilient to attacks that target the solution itself. Uh, another requirement for our solution was that it, it needed, we recognize that job assignments and share submissions are very common packets, so any efficient solution should try to actively avoid encrypting these very common packets. And finally, we want to uh, propose minimum modifications to the Stratum protocol so that the solution is actually uh, so to increase the adaptability of our solution. Now, let me walk you through the uh, motivations of our solution, which we call Bedrock. Uh, remember that the attackers in attacks one and two, they use crucially the fact that they could actually uh, measure the difficulty of their jobs. So we essentially, a sensible choice would be to just encrypt the set difficulty packets. And of course, this is totally useless if you would still allow the pool to set the default difficulty. So we are further proposing that the, it is the miner who actually sets the initial difficulty. As it turns out, the attacker can still reconstruct the template because it has the information from the job submissions or the job assignments. And it also has, uh, of course, the information from the, from the shared submissions, which are the nonsense. And this arrow was actually here. So with, with all this information, the attacker simply calculates the uh, double SHA-256 function and reads off the leading bits of, of the hash. And he can still recover an estimate of the difficulty of all these shares. Now, in order to solve this problem, we uh, introduced the concept of mining cookies that essentially uh, introduce a shared secret between the miner and the pool. And we're depicting it here with the letter RM. And essentially, this shared secret goes into the process of creating this block template. Now, since this RM is not uh, ever exchanged in clear text on the wire, the attacker is not able to uh, recreate the template, and he's not able to actually get a hold of the, of the payout earnings of the miner. We also uh, include, the, in this mining cookie, we also include the username. And so we essentially avoid the second attack, too, or the last attack also. The final uh, requirement is that we propose minimal modifications to the Stratum protocol. And we are essentially proposing using an unused field in the block of the, uh, the Bitcoin block. But any other um, unused field can be used just as well. And this is our evaluation of our solution. We compare it to um, SSL or, or, blank, or TLS or blanket encryption. And as far as passive attacks, Bedrock actually provides equivalent uh, protection with a lot less overhead, which we see in this graph. It's a couple of, order of, of orders of magnitudes better in performance. And it turns out that as, as far as active attacks, Bedrock actually provides a little bit better protection than SSL by defeating attacks that target the encryption cryptography. This means that it doesn't matter if you choose your primes incorrectly or, or if you use a Trojanized al uh, encryption algorithm um, because the Bitcoin, uh, because the mining cookie concept, uh, is the, the security is based on the hashing algorithm, then these active attacks are also prevented. 
Now, as a summary, uh, I have introduced uh, three attacks on a stratum that allow us to do payout disclosure. Uh, it also allows us to uh, steal computational resources. I have also shown that encryption is not only insufficient, but it is also not necessary to protect from, for these attacks. And I have introduced the bedrock solution and the concept of mining cookies. And I have also shown that the that bedrock actually outperforms TLS and similar solutions. And with that, I will now take questions if <laughs> no, it is Thank you.